Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Judge David Wedby. Um, thanks for attending this uh, Zoom chat. Um, in light of the 30th anniversary of the America with Disability Act, I thought it would be interesting to convene a panel to discuss the reasonable accommodation in the Washington State's Department of Cor Corrections to see how far the DC has come um, to the sense of the cutting edge disability issues facing the DOC and to hear from Disability Rights Washington, which, is a, which has a federal mandate to investigate prison conditions um, and to weigh in on with any critiques or comments on structural or institutional shortcomings regarding the ADA's promise of removing barriers to inclusion and integrating prisoners with disability into the services, programs, and activities DOC provides. Um, our three panelists are um, Risa Clemmy from the DOC, Candy Dibble, who is an Assistant Attorney General, and Heather McKimmy from the Disability Rights Washington. Um, Ms. Clemmy has worked for the Washington State Department of Corrections for 25 years, serving in a variety of capacities, including policy coordinator, public information officer, legal liaison, and currently serves as the statewide ADA compliance manager. Um, she, prior to her career in corrections, she was employed um, at the Department of Administrative Services for a nonprofit community mental health center in Seattle for 10 years and worked with the American Red Cross. Ms. Clemmy is going to be talking about um, the reasonable accreditation process itself, um, how disabilities are identified um, within the DOC, and discuss the request process for the uh, reasonable accommodation along with how prisoners might challenge that um, process. Ms. Dibble is, um, as I said, she's an assistant uh, attorney general since 2010. Uh, she currently serves um, as a unit lead in the corrections division where she primarily handles civil rights and public records act to defend in both state and federal courts. Um, prior to um, her coming to Washington, she worked as an assistant solicitor uh, in the state of Carolina, uh, South Carolina, um, trying felony criminal matters. And then also just prior to coming to Washington, she worked in the Del Delaware Department of Corrections where she assisted in compliance with um, a memorandum of agreement between the DDOC and the U US Department of Justice regarding allegations of Eighth Amendment violations related to offender mental, mental and health and medical care. Um, finally, Heather, McKimmy has been an attorney with um, DRW Disability Rights Washington since August 2009. Uh, she is currently the director of the AVID program, which focuses on advocacy for individuals with disability, disabilities in Washington prisons, jails, and the Special Commitment Center. Um, AVID advocates for criminal legal system reform by speaking directly to incarcerated individuals, inspecting conditions at correctional facilities, negotiating with correction administrators, educating policymakers, producing videos, writing reports, and litigating when necessary. Um, prior to going to DRW, there was a criminal defense attorney at the trial appellate levels. So um, thank you all very much for your willingness to participate today. Um, as I talked with all of you at the outset, my idea was that perhaps judges, I hope there are some in attendance, and others would be interested um, to learn what a person who comes into here, his or her court um, that with a disability and goes to the um, DOC system, what they have to deal with, and um, just so the judge might be more mindful of those types of things when sentencing. I'm also interested in the overall um, sort of trajectory of how the DOC has um, heated the ADA mandate of reasonable accommodation process over the years and where we are now. So with that, Ms. Um, Clemmy, I invite your comments. Thank you very much. All right, I appreciate you having me. I'm always thrilled to talk about uh, matters surrounding the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, I'm passionate about it and should be as I'm the ADA Compliance Manager. Um, as a Title II agency, the Department of Corrections um, is required to provide individuals within our custody and whom we supervise um, with access to program services and activities. And that's kind of our overall mandate for ADA. Um, 
to just give you a little bit of background on how our ADA department's organized, um, my supervisor, my boss is the director, uh, medical director of quality. I think that that in itself speaks to law DOC's importance of ADA. Um, a lot of states, their ADA program is under um, a civil rights litigation um, or um, some other kind of department. And in our state, we have chosen to put our ADA under the health services, uh, which I think was a smart decision because it, it allows us to tie in with healthcare providers. Um, and it also um, sends a message that we're not doing this because of litigation. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do. So I think it's a good, uh, it was a good move. Um, I'm the ADA compliance manager and I'm overly responsible for training our ADA coordinators. We have ADA coordinators at each of our 12 prisons, our 12 work release facilities. And we have seven community correction sections. And we have one at each section. Um, I'm also responsible for doing physical plan assessments, uh, working with advocacy groups such as um, Disability Rights Washington, um, the Office of Correctional Ombuds, DOJ, and others um, concerning disability matters, complaints, concerns. Um, and I also promote policy changes and provide training not only to our ADA coordinators, but to our staff or staff groups within our facilities to increase ADA awareness, provide information, problem solve. Um, we have a full-time deaf services coordinator and she is, she is a, a certified interpreter and she's responsible for coordinating services to our uh, deaf incarcerated individuals or people that, who are on supervision who need interpreting services. We have 20 um, contract interpreters that provide services to our deaf population. Um, and she also manages a lot of the accommodations that deaf folks need when they're in prison, for example, access to video relay services, FM systems, pagers, and other things of that nature. So we do that. So how does DOC identify folks with disabilities? Um, everyone who comes into prison comes into either Shelton, um, which is the Washington Correction Center, if they are male, or to the Women's Correction, uh, the Washington Correction Center for Women, which is in uh, Gig Harbor. Um, they, we, as soon as they walk in the door, we have a healthcare assessment of them. And um, sometimes, as you know, of course, many disabilities are very apparent. If you're walking in with a white cane, we know you have a disability, right? Um, and or if you're coming in and you're mentally unstable, we immediately identify that. And those issues are identified and dealt with immediately. But as you know, um, some disabilities don't really come to the forefront until later. Um, we have people that are in prison a long time. They develop disabilities along the way. Um, they age. Um, or maybe their uh, disability isn't all that apparent, but becomes more apparent later as they settle into prison. And some, frankly, don't really want to announce their disabilities for fear of being outed or being bullied or uh, other reasons. So um, there's a variety of reasons why people don't just step forward with their hand in the air the first minute they're there and say, hey, I have a disability. Um, and I think that that's true in the public, too. Um, so all everybody who comes to prison, um, as I said, they get this initial mental health and, and health care assessment, and then they get a more full uh, integrated health uh, history and physical where we check their eyes and their hearing and their dental and all of, and mental health and all of those things. And it's at that point that the medical provider does a more thorough um, or does a thorough exam and then really gets to the, the nub of um, what disabilities this person may have. And the other thing that they do is they identify disabilities and start making a, uh, some healthcare accommodations for that um, because a lot of our, a lot of our accommodations are done through the healthcare provider. Um, through their uh, prescriptive authority to prescribe 
walkers, wheelchairs, braces, ice packs, and all of those things, um, just like a provider would on the outside. And, um, and then there's things that they would refer to the ADA side of the house, which is things that are medically appropriate, but not medically necessary, but they are appropriate given a disability. For example, someone who is deaf, it's not medically necessary we provide an interpreter, but is it the right thing to do and appropriate given their, their disability of being deaf? Of course it is. So that's where the, the ADA side of the house comes in. Um, just as a, as a uh, point of information, we do have a pathway to share limited information with all staff concerning uh, an individual's level of functioning while they're in prison. And we need to do that because we need to ensure that we provide appropriate housing for the person um, and that they're housed safely um, and they're housed at the right facility. Um, and we do that through the use of what we call pull -hease codes. Well, our pull -hease codes are kind of designed kind of loosely around um, uh, military military used to use to, to say how somebody's functioning. And so we have a set of codes that are kind of benign, but everybody has access to, so we appropriately house people. And I'm just gonna go through them very, very quickly, and you can ask questions later. But the pull heats codes are P-U-L-H-E-S-D-X-T-R. P stands for their general health service utilization and kind of their overall health. How healthy are they? So a one means a guy or a lady is very healthy. A four or a four would mean that they're very unhealthy, right? Um, and all levels in between. The U stands for their medication uh, delivery service requirement. So if they have a one, they're not on any meds, but as they move up from a one to a four, they may have uh, keep on person medication where they're allowed to keep it in their cell, in their house, or they may need to go to a pill line, um, or maybe they have some other very serious medication needs. Um, L is their limitations of mobility. So an L1 is uh, I'm walking, have no mobility issues with my arms or legs, but uh, maybe a three means I'm in a wheelchair. Um, or a four means that uh, uh, five means that I can't move at all. Maybe I'm, I'm paraplegic um, or I've had a stroke and I'm unable to use my body. Um, and, and H stands for developmental disabilities. So everybody that comes into prison, we get a list from the office of, uh, from the DDA, Developmental Disabilities Administration that tells us if they receive services under the DDA as children um, or youth up to the age of 18. And if they have, they're automatically coded as a four because we accept what DSHS has already, the testing they've already done. And then um, they could be a one, two or a three under that depending upon their level of uh, disability or cognition. Um, the E stands for sensory disabilities. Um, an, an E2 means that you have a hearing deficit. Uh, an E3 means, excuse me, an E2 means that you have a sight deficit. And an E3 means you have a hearing deficit. And an E4 means you have both. And it's very common, of course, for people that have uh, hearing issues or sight issues to also have both. So, um, and then uh, S is their mental health service utilization. So again, a one is uh, very functional, a four might be, um, they need to be housed in a mental health unit. Um, I brought in a question. Um, yes. And I wanted to say at the outset that the way we've structured this um, talk is that Candy may, a topic comes up that Candy would like to weigh in on that, that's relevant or Heather then we invited them yes. to do that and, and me, myself. And also if there's anybody out there that would like to um, write up a question in, in the chat and I'm, I'm looking at that and can pose the question if it's appropriate given subject matter. So that's kind of how we're approaching this. So my question was, um, is there any way that a, a sentencing judge might flag a potential issue, let's just assume for a, a mental disability or some other disability that um, is say less apparent than mm -hmm. somebody who uses a wheelchair? Is there any way to do that? 
that will get transmitted to um, DOC to take that into account? I have not heard from judges, but I have heard from several defense attorneys um, on when their uh, client has been sentenced. Um, and they're, they've reached out to me because I'm on the DOC website. So they reached out to me to say, hey, I have a, my client's going to, I think he's going to be sentenced or her going to be sentenced and they have XYZ kind of disability. Um, what do you do for those people? So uh, we have, I have had that dialogue. Okay. Yeah. And you people can do that. So anyway, going on to the, to the other th uh, four is dental. Uh, we, we rate them for dental. And then X is their ADA accommodation needs. So people that have a high code for accommodation, um, maybe uh, they have multiple disabilities. So for example, somebody who was profoundly deaf and needed interpreters, they would be an X3. Um, and then transportation needs and finally suicide risk. So we, we do uh, a one means you uh, don't have a history of suicide. A two means you have a history of suicide. And that, of course, would be very important for us to know in prison. So how do we um, ensure access to accommodation and compliance? Um, all, as I mentioned before, we, every facility has a designated ADA coordinator. And so, um, and we are all required by policy to post a notice of rights to offenders with disabilities in our intake units um, areas and in our in, uh, and our individual um, living units for um, so that people would know. And I believe they're also posted in our law libraries so that people that have disabilities know what their rights are. Um, and also individuals are notified um, during the or every person that comes into prison goes through a mandatory orientation. And part of the orientation is to notify them of their rights and our responsibilities and um, to notify them of who the ADA coordinator is and how to reach out for uh, accommodations if they need it. Um, any, any individual that's incarcerated or on supervision or in a work release training facility has the right and ability to reach out to the ADA coordinator um, through Kite, through Kiosk, which is like an email, um, write a letter, um, but they can write, reach out to any staff person. They can talk to their classification counselor. They could talk to the officer or the CUS or, the, or write the superintendent or their healthcare provider. So it's not just that, oh, we can't talk to you. You can only talk to the ADA coordinator. They have the ability and the right to reach out to anybody that they feel comfortable with to say, hey, I, I need something. And then we'll get them linked up to the ADA coordinator um, to get that need met. Are those, um, are those, sorry to put it again, are those intermediaries duty bound to relay the ADA um, accommodation request? And the reason I'm thinking about that is because in outside of the prison context, um, when your request for accommodation doesn't have to even use those words, as long right. as the employer's on notice of a medical condition, let's say there's an interactive process requirement right. that then that then triggers on the, um, for the employer in this example. So uh, does the same idea apply in the DOC setting where let's say a, a, a counselor, you know, hears that somebody has trouble hearing or, or whatever, whatever the medical condition would be to relay, relay that to the ADA coordinator? That happens all the time. It happens a lot with healthcare providers because they're, they do the hearing test, right? And they, they say, oh, wow, this guy, he's person has uh, lost significant hearing since we last checked them. So maybe they, uh, they would reach out to the ADA coordinator um, and say, hey, could you uh, do some accommodations for this person? Um, also their counselors, I mean, the people that are on the units that, that work around individuals, they know more than anybody um, if they're having struggles. And they often come to us and say, hey, this person is um, not making it to call out. Um, he's, he's not, he's not uh, for whatever reason. And maybe the reason is he's not hearing or maybe the reason is he's losing his cognitive abilities because of age. 
um, or other medical issues. So that they, staff are the greatest, really, people that say, hey, we need to take a look at this person. So um, that's something that's been ingrained and embedded in our policies. And um, our staff, I think, do a very good job of, raise, of bringing forward if there's an issue. Um, so to, to um, I think DOC has always been a little bit progressive with accommodations, but I will tell you um, in uh, May of 2017, we launched a kind of a new way for accommodations to occur. And um, prior to that time, ADA accommodations were largely either um, informal um, or they were prescribed by the healthcare provider. And under the way we do accommodations now, we've kind of put a bright line in the sand between what are healthcare accommodations like wheelchairs, walkers, braces, Upper, no upper bunk, things like that. And what are ADA accommodations, which are things like a talking watch or a vibrating watch, or, hey, you can take a time out from, uh, from work if you need to, or um, we're giving, gonna give you earplugs because you get migraines and you're, you live, you're in the IMU. Any, any of those kinds of things, um, fall under the ADA because they're not medically necessary, but again, they're appropriate given in somebody's medical conditions. So to, to ensure that we have a fair, and the other big thing that we want is we wanted a system that was fair and equitable and, and was statewide. Because prior to that time, what happened was um, people at one facility, if the ADA coordinator was really engaged, they kind of got a lot of stuff. In other facilities, the ADA coordinator wasn't engaged and they didn't. So the new system requires a lot more accountability from our ADA coordinators um, and uh, is a much fairer system. And the system is also built in with, a, um, with an appeal process. Okay. When did that shift occur? Um, May of 2017. So we've been doing it for three years now and it actually works pretty well. So what happens is when the ADA coordinator becomes aware of an accommodation need, either from the individual or from uh, health services or somebody, uh, unit staff or who, who, uh, their teacher, or whoever, um, they meet with the um, individual and uh, talk about the accommodation needed and then fill out some paperwork, some simple paperwork um, and submit it to me. And we have a once a month meeting where we consider all the cases. So it's kind of like a care review committee with docs, only we're ADA. So once, once a month, we have a conference call and we go through all our cases and we have between um, seven and 15 cases a month um, that we go through. Um, we also have a pathway for people that need immediate accommodations. I can just immediately approve them with follow up with the committee. And usually immediate approvals are because somebody's uh, walking in the door to prison and they usually have severe sensory issues with uh, either hearing or vision and they need, they need things right now. So we just, we get that done for them. Um, yes. May I ask a couple questions right now that I'm just seeing yeah. from the gallery that are, that are apt? Um, there's one question that says, inquiring whether there's a DOC document that explains the distinction between healthcare uh, related accommodations and what you were describing as ADA um, mm -hmm. accommodations? Um, we have two document, two primary documents, maybe three. Um, first, we have a policy, um, 69400 um, Individuals with Disabilities, which kind of maps out and it does have a section in there on accommodations. We also have a, an accommodation uh, pro medical protocol so um, within our healthcare system, we have protocols that govern a lot of the things that we do in healthcare. And one of them is the um, accommodation status report protocol, which again outlines um, what is required under for me and for ADA coordinators. And then we also have our health uh, status report protocol, which is the prescriptive uh, venue for health provi healthcare providers to uh, prescribe 
uh, medically necessary items like w the wheelchairs, the walkers, those things. So we we do have it in embedded in the policy, in training, and and in our protocols. And then I then I have one follow up question um, from Judge Kale on the question that I had posed earlier. So he asks, um, does a notation or a request from a judge uh, on on the judgment and sentencing or the judgment and sentence have any impact at all once one enters the DOC world? I'm not sure what you mean. If they put well, a note on there about disability? That's what I assume from the question that, again, sort of echoing what I had asked, whether if a judge picking up on, I don't know, somebody who might be you know, developmentally de delayed, or maybe there's evidence in the record from the criminal defense attorney testing that kind of thing to mitigate the sentence or whatever, and then um, the sentence is the sentence, and then, but can a judge sort of underscore the the mental disability in this example, for instance, um, to emphasize to the DOC they should really look at something rather than relying on the criminal defense attorney or the person himself to advocate? I don't know, Candy might want to weigh in on that, but um, I guess what I would say is I have not seen that happen, um, but certainly it would be um, a consideration in terms, I mean, it would be, a, it, to me, it would be a heads up, oh, we really need to pay attention to this. Well, well so, I was just, I'll, this is the last point, I'll let you continue, sorry to keep interrupting you, but um, I mean, it might, if there are judges who are mindful of this, and, and there, it's just ad hoc at this point, it might be helpful if the DOE did come up with some sort of uh, best practice or something like that for judges. So again, we could sort of streamline the transition um, for somebody who's going into the DOC system. I think that might be helpful, yeah. at least to some of us. And I believe, you know, in talking with our classification folks at headquarters, they also hear from, um, uh, defense attorneys, and they may also hear from judges too about uh, housing options for their uh, clients. And like I say, I've had uh, defense attorneys call me um, for on behalf advocating for their client, and I have no issue with that. It's very appropriate. And in fact, actually, to be honest with you, I kind of if somebody really has a significant disability, it's kind of a nice heads up to know that so that we're, we're very prepared for that person when they come. So David, I can weigh in a bit because we have received some orders um, on criminal cases from courts um, that there's a difference between providing information to DOC beforehand so that things can be flagged as opposed to orders that are specifically um, requesting or ordering DOC to do something as part of that um, criminal sentence, right? And so, for instance, one, one example, or I can give you, this happens quite often. Um, we have gotten uh, someone who comes in and as part of an order, the defense attorney managed to get the judge to sign off indicating that um, they believe that their client had some type of issue or medical issue with being able to provide a urine sample and so therefore that they needed to provide um, blood samples every single time that they were to get tested instead of a UA. So it's um, with certain things like that and DOC's position with that is um, there are certain things that obviously we need to know about, but we would prefer that our medical providers, um, when that inmate comes in to DOC custody, that our medical providers actually, um, I guess, confirm that and that the DOC medical providers are in the, going to be in the best position to determine whether or not there needs to be some type of accommodation provided to someone um, based on their examination of that specific individual. So it kind of, um, when it creeps into a little bit of a, and we have received a few orders that have said DOC has to do X, Y, and Z when this person's in custody, um, that ends up getting into a whole different other area that usually DOC will reach out to us and say, hey, we've got some questions on how this, whether or not we, we have to apply um, this recommendation from the court. Well, I, I, I would, I think it would be very helpful again to me as a 
screen judge to to understand kind of where the lines are and from the DOC's perspective as what information is helpful and what information um, creates more problems or gets pushed back or whatever. Um, and I don't know how, is there some sort of liaison that we, that you could identify? Well, Risa, I believe all of your information is available on the DOC public website. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And just to confirm too, I know that DOC policies are available on the website. Risa, is, are any of the other forms that you discussed um, available on the DOC website? The forms relative to the policy would be, I don't know if the protocols are on the public website. I don't think they are. The ASR and HSR protocols, I don't think are on the website. Yeah. But the policy for sure is, and the policy does do a pretty good job of outlining our accommodation process. So, mm -hmm. and and um, I, of course, am, am on the website too, if, if people need to reach out. So. Um, so, Risa, I think it might be a little bit helpful to the audience to talk about, I, I know that you talked about identifying needs for accommodations, but, um, and I think some of the concern is how DOC ensu ensures kind of continuity of those accommodations when someone's yeah. coming in. So is there any way you can elaborate on that or explain um, if someone has some concerns that someone's, um, especially, I know medication is a little bit more difficult um, as far as diagnosis on the outside, how someone's able to continue continuity of that medication when they come in DOC custody um, for mm -hmm. mental health disabilities or anything else like that. Right. Can you expand a little bit on that? So um, I am not a, a provider, so I, I want to be careful what I say here, but um, people that come in on medications, we don't just throw them out the window. We, we continue them um, until we uh, go through the history and physical and make sure um, that they're stable. And then at that point, they may make changes to their meds. But we don't we don't just take people off their meds that come in on medication, um, and the same would be true if they're coming in like with a wheelchair. We're not going to just say, "Oh, we have an assessment for a wheelchair. We're going to just take that away." That's not how how it works. Um, but the idea for me for accommodations as the manager for the ADA accommodations piece is the idea is not to thwart um, people's um, ability to get accommodations or access uh, in ways that they can access accommodations. And that's why we've tried to make it that, that there's multiple ways people can ask for an accommodation or bring to our attention. And we also have responsibility to, to observe and see that somebody is struggling and reach out to them because they may have uh, barriers to asking for an accommodation, for example, um, maybe mental health barriers, or maybe just um, age and fragility, and they don't really know what they need or how to ask. So we, uh, the intent of ADA, in my mind, with DOC, is not to thwart someone's ability to ask for, get, or receive an accommodation. Um, that's really not what I'm in the business of. And in fact, my statistics for providing accommodations through our accommodation review committee, um, most of the accommodations are approved. The accommodations that aren't approved are either because um, maybe it falls really more under a medical issue versus an ADA issue, or there's no, we can't, there's no disability that we can verify that, that uh, needs to be accommodated. Um, so most of the times the approval is a yes. We're not really in the business of trying to deny um, what people need. Um, and I think that that's important. And we've also done a couple of things that made that more possible. One of the things that we did to make it more possible to get the most accommodations approved was we've included the captain or the senior custody person um, as part of the process. Um, so they sign off on the accommodation request, not um, simply as a security measure, 
But but the kicker with it is, is that we actually went to the statewide security advisory council, which is made up of captains and security, top level security people. And we took um, various accommodations and had them pre-approved. So we took like three examples of talking watches and three examples of vibrating watches and three examples of wheelchair um, gloves and things like that. And we took them. And we said, here, we gave, first I gave some training to them about ADA. And then we, we went through all of the accommodation items and they pre-approved, this is the brand that we want you to use because that will meet our security, security requirements. So now when we have somebody who needs something, we can approve it and we know that it's been vetted by our security and also, the intent is, is that when they move from facility A to facility B, that accommodation goes with them in most instances. Um, Risa, and, can you um, briefly explain what the difference is between your approval for um, what may be an appropriate as a accommodation as opposed to what a medical provider may find medically necessary? Well, for example, um, as you know, if, if you go to your physician right now and say, hey, I need a wheelchair. Um, if you want your physician to put to approve that so that your uh, health insurance or Medicaid or however you're covered under insurance, they have to do a, a physical exam and be able to document in their health record why, why you meet the criteria for a wheelchair. And that's no different than what our healthcare providers do when they prescribe um, accommodations, and I consider a wheelchair an accommodation, um, or a walker or any other thing, they have to meet the criteria for that item. And so that's, they have a license and the prescriptive authority to um, prescribe those items. I, neither me nor any of my um, ADA coordinators have a healthcare license to stand on to say, I, in my um, medical opinion, this person needs a wheelchair, which is why we don't prescribe those. But we are trained on accommodations and we are trained on um, the ADA. And we are able to say, these are accommodations that um, would be appropriate for somebody because they're hard of hearing or maybe they, they need something for school or their job, maybe they need to be able to sit um, on a, a special pad when they're working because it, it because of their back or something. We we can do those kinds of things. Did that answer your question? I th I think so. If not, Jesse will weigh in again. So. Um, and, you know, and part of it is that we do recognize also that um, healthcare isn't static. Um, you know, people are in prison sometimes a long time. And just like out in the community, people get cancer, they get, you know, they age, um, they have uh, other things that come up, their eyes fail, whatever it is, they get cataracts, whatever. Um, so the ADA um, accommodations starts at intake, but it doesn't end at intake. Um, people are able to ask for ADA accommodations at any point within their um, journey in, in prison or work release. Um, there's no set time that they have to ask or that they can't ask. So we, we keep that going. Um, a lot, and in a lot of cases, it, we find out again about people's need for accommodations through the healthcare provider because as people are getting older, they're seeing, hey, their 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 hearing is failing or other things, and so that gives us an opportunity to provide accommodations. So and I know that there there was kind of a question about I saw something blip up about we're only providing this many accommodations, be, um, you know seven to 15 in a month. I want to address that because again, most of the accommodations that are provided to the incarcerated population is from the healthcare side. Um, the, the ADA side of accommodations is um, a lot smaller pot 
of things that we do. Um, so that's why um, if, if we were talking about healthcare accommodations, there would be hundreds, <laughs> hundreds. There, there are hundreds provided every day um, through uh, permission to, you know, or prescriptions for, hey, don't house this person on an upper bunk. Don't put them on a lower tier. Um, he needs an ADA cell. All those things, all those things are, are prescribed by the healthcare provider. So that's why our group is a lot less, but it's, but it's very important. Um, okay. I'm, let me, let me, I'm going to try to understand the distinction a little bit better. So um, the seminal case in, in this jurisprudence that said that um, the ADA applies to state prisons was a case called Esky. And in Yeski, mm -hmm. the man was, a, he had hypertension and he wanted to participate in boot camp, um, which would have had the effect of making him eligible for parole six months earlier, I think. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, what I'm trying to figure out is if, that, if there's no question that he has hypertension, but he wants to access a program um, sort of beyond something that's it's sort of get out of the medical necessity um, paradigm, I guess. Is that something that would come to you? And do you have to have a project say, look, I really want to participate in this particular education program or um, recreation or the, the thing with the yes. canines, for instance, right. you know, um, and, and do you then do you approach you as the ADA coordinator with that? As long as your medical diagnosis is undisputed, is that was that is that how it would work? That's a really good question. And I think I have the answer. So um, remember I talked earlier about our pull haste codes? And, and so when, when a person moves from facility to facility or changes custody levels to uh, a minimum security unit or a camp or a work release training facility, um, those codes give us information as to where to house them. So not every facility that we have is um, can accommodate everything that anybody might have, but we have facilities that can accommodate everything that some people might have. So um, when you look at our major facilities, most of them, most of them with uh, one exception, can accommodate people that are um, have no problems to very, very, very sick. Right. Um, when you get down to our camps, we have some camps that um, don't take people that are on uh, certain medications that go to pill line because they don't have 24 seven nursing. And then we have other facilities that do. Um, we have and when we get to work uh, training facilities, um, we have many facilities that are um, ADA accessible. Um, and able to uh, take people that have uh, dis a range of disabilities. And then we have some that are not very accessible to be honest with you. But when you look at our, um, at our agency and facilities as a whole, we are accessible. And in fact, um, when, when in 2013, 2014, when we did our Title II assessments, which I was uh, the lead person on that project for physical accessibility, we also looked at program accessibility as part of it. So we took programs from every facility um, and looked at our uh, programs as a whole. And what we found is that as a whole, our agency does uh, meet the standards for accessible programming um, for individuals. Um, Risa, I think with that, I, I'm going to transition to Candy just because we we only have half hour left, I'm afraid. Yes. And um, I do want to hear from Candy, and of course, I want to hear from um, Heather also. So, okay. Candy, why don't you go ahead and just take 10 minutes or so and tell us about sort of the novel issues that you're dealing with, and then we'll go to, to Heather, um, the last speaker. Sure. So since about 2006, um, either in the capacity of working with the Delaware Department of Corrections or then eventually transitioning to um, Washington State, you know, the areas, and I think Heather will definitely agree, right, the cutting edge areas or the areas that um, seem to pop up 
are consistently changing, right? So in 2006, when I sat um, and we had lots of national experts who are assisting Delaware Department of Corrections with their handling of inmate medical care, mental health care, ADA accommodations, everything along the lines, even um, you know, some things that were brought up in 2006 as being uh, kind of gold standards of uh, providing accommodations um, are now completely outdated, right? And so um, it consistently changes. Uh, you know, back in 2006, I was dealing with a lot of medical mental health issues. And as you know, Judge Wedby, uh, the medical issues and how DOC handles medical stuff um, continues uh, to be of litigation. Um, but, you know, one of the things that back in 2006 was not even on the table that Heather and I are involved in right now are um, DOC's accommodations of uh, transgender inmates, right? And that seems to be, I can tell you at least um, from a large majority of the nationwide case law seems to be up and coming area right now is how um, DOC's and jails are handling and we're not just talking about um, access to certain medical care for uh, inmates that have been diagnosed with gender dysphoria, mental health care, but it even gets into housing. It gets into um, naming conventions. It gets into um, access to programming, um, which are all things that we are dealing with now. Um, you know, the great thing that I can say is that um, I've been lucky enough to work with Delaware Department of Corrections and with Washington State. Um, and the DOC seems to be very interested in um, finding out about these issues before they get to be larger problems. And while no one wants oversight all the time, and while no one wants someone constantly telling them, like, hey, you're doing this wrong, um, there is a huge benefit to that, right? And I think that um, DOC recognizes that because housing 16,000 inmates is tough trying to figure out exactly um, what the issues are um, is even tougher. And so we very much need um, organizations like DRW and Columbia Legal Services and the Ombuds Office um, to assist us with identifying and addressing those matters. Is that me? Okay. <laughs> yes, what's, what's your perspective on all this? Oh, lots of perspective. Um, I thought I'd maybe give a, like a couple of minute um, intro to like why we know things. I think people, a lot of people haven't heard so much of, of Disability Rights Washington. And you mentioned briefly that we're the protection and advocacy agency or we have federal mandates to go into places, um, not specifically to prisons actually. A lot of agencies like ours do not work in prisons. It's something oh. that we have identified as being really important where a lot of people with disabilities are. Um, so, you know, we get, we have access to go into places where people with disabilities receive services. And we think the prisons is a big one. I mean, there's a really high percentage of people in prison who either came in with disabilities, acquired them while they're in prison. Um, you know, the conditions of prison can be disabling themselves. So we're, um, we go into prisons and actually see what's going on. We can go to the units where most folks can't go. We can go to solitary confinement medical isolation and, and talk to folks. And we also have the ability to get records really quickly if we believe abuse and neglect is occurring. So when we come to DOC with concerns, it's not just based on the reports of, of people, which we, we take in and we you know, trust those, but we usually follow up with document requests and then show um, DOC like why things are concerning to us. And when we talk about disabilities, we talk about all types of disabilities. So. Um, recently went through a lot of them, physical disabilities, sensory disabilities, so people um, who are deaf or hard of hearing or have low vision or blind, um, people with developmental disabilities, learning disabilities, traumatic brain injury, mental health disabilities, um, chronic health conditions, so diabetes, um, heart conditions, things like that. Um, so I, I appreciate you reading out the list of all the ways that we advocate. We do try to do a lot of our um, advocacy in collaboration. We often find that we can get further and further faster if, if we have an agreeable party on the other side um, to get change that is um, more specifically helpful to folks. So, um, and we, the issues that we tackle are based on what people 
come to us with, the people who are incarcerated come to us with those issues. And if there are enough people coming to us with one issue, then we go after those. One of them being, you know, several years ago that there was no real way to track when someone has an ADA accommodation. Um, that's when we came to GOC and said, hey, can we do something about like in the piece of paper, getting that information in the computer somewhere so that people, when they move, this, this kind of informal accommodation that was happening at one facility, they don't have to start over when they move to the next facility. So that was kind of like born this um, practice that Risa was describing, um, this accommodation status report where you, you have actual documentation and there's a process to get those accommodations. Um, so I think when we talk about, which is a vast improvement over what used to be the process, what is difficult, I think, about the ADA in prison in any um, jail or any other carceral setting is that the ADA is meant to be a tool to have an individualized accommodation. And prison in general is not a place where there's a lot of individualization. And so, um, I think Risa and has done things to try to move those things along. Like the, 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 the practice Risa described of getting a bunch of things pre-approved for security, I think is, a, is very helpful to a large number of people. Um, but then there's those situations that I think always come to us. Like you don't, people don't call us and they're like, oh yeah, I got my accommodation approved. Everything's great, just wanted to check in. So when everybody's calling us, it's because something's usually not working the way uh, they want it to. And so we get the call about the, you know, one out of the 12 that wasn't approved. And that's usually when we come and, you know, talk to Risa. Um, and usually those are because they're, they're much more um, complicated and individualized issue. It, it's not the simple um, pain issue or the, the books on tape or, or things that are, you know, pretty easy to work with. It's someone who maybe often has a mental health diagnosis and like PTSD or things that are wrapped up that aren't like a more physical disability. Um, so, you know, there, I think there's, that's one of the issues is that the, the ability to be individualized is a little bit more difficult when you have, you know, a bureaucracy like a prison setting and security concerns over that. When you're out in the community and you need some kind of special shoe, you can just go to the store and get the special shoe. In prison, you've got to go through some kind of process to get that type of, um, shoe or whatever it is approved and, and that can be difficult for folks. Um, I think one of the things that um, we've often pointed out that there are ADA coordinators at all of the facilities and you know this isn't their full-time job. They're doing a lot of other things and um, some of the difficulty that we've had in the past is, is you know folks having enough time to do what we think is the more nuanced discussion around and, and talking to people getting that information about what would work best for someone. So it really is an interactive process. Like I have this, this thing that I want accommodation for. What, um, if that doesn't work, what are the alternatives? Let's have this interactive process. And I think when someone, when it's, you know, a small portion of someone's job, those kind of things can be uh, difficult. And I think there was some question, comments in here about like, where is the line between ADA and medical? And that's been a, one of our big challenges is really trying to define that there often isn't a real bright line. Um, and, you know, you might get bounced back and forth between those two processes and how do we, how do we help people guide, you know, it shouldn't take months to get an accommodation if, if you can't figure out where it fits in medical or ADA. Um, let's see what else. Oh, one thing that came up was um, uh, like physical accommodations versus programmatic accommodations. And I think that in general, DOC is real responsive when say something is not physically accessible in a place. Um, and they did do an audit around, you know, maybe it's, it's ramp availability or the slope of a, of a walkway, uh, width of a door, like those types of things. I feel like um, we come across those, that's not our main focus, but we come across those, if we point those out to DOC, I feel like those, are, that, those concerns are heard those things are generally taken care of. The programmatic piece is again, much more individualized. And so how someone's accessing education or if they need some kind of special accommodation and work, I feel like those are, um, again, some of the harder things to accommodate and work through because there's so many pieces that go into that. There's a, there's a boss, there's the ADA coordinator. Um, those can be more complicated to navigate. You have a I, just, yeah. I just wanna chime in on that because that, that, that's, 
that's the rub, it seems to me, which is where, and and it's solved by, by it seems to me, also what the law requires is the interactive process, mm -hmm. because many of these things are situational. They are nuanced. They are depend on how the individual can or cannot navigate certain facilities or programs or wants to access a program but needs, you know, the, the accommodation. And um, I'm just, and I'm also hearing, I'm just trying to echo too, a, a observation from the gallery that, um, and, you know, it can take some time to get what you need within DOC. So I'm wondering how that interactive process, well, one, I'm, I'm wondering if it's a thing, if it's a concept that's taught um, or embraced and then taught within the DOC system. And then secondly, if so, what are the ideas about refining that so people can understand it better and then the process can be um, more effective? And that's just an overarching sort of question and comment. Yeah. And Heather, you can keep talking, but I would just, I, I would be really curious to hear a response to that question. I would yeah, be I mean, willing to- Go ahead, Risa. I mean, I think that's, Risa can tell like how the training is done on the interactive process. Yeah, well, we do, um, all of our ADA coordinators um, have at least eight hours of training every year, mandatory training on ADA, um, communication, disability etiquette, ADA stuff. Um, we also, when we have our monthly meeting, um, I use that as an opportunity for updates and information and training. But, in ter but to address the issue of that interactive process, one of the tools that we use in DOC is what we call a multidisciplinary team. And I have done several of those. Um, and I would, I, I think we should do more of them, frankly. And what a multidisciplinary team is, is that so somebody say somebody needs an accommodation for school or work or something like that. So we, we get together with the healthcare provider, ADA, the classification uh, staff person, the, um, the employer, um, any, and maybe custody, and we get them all in the room and we have a discussion about, well, what does this person need to ensure their success to be able to work or program or do whatever? And then how, how can we, what's some ideas that we can accommodate that? And then we, once we have had a discussion, we bring in the um, individual and have a conversation with them to see what, it, uh, and start that interactive process for the accommodation. But I have found that multidisciplinary teams is a very good and valuable tool to kind of get drilled down what somebody needs um, to be successful. And usually when we use those, it's because they're struggling in work or programming or oftentimes programming that's court mandated like um, sex offender uh, treatment program. I mean, those, those will have a liberty interest for somebody. So we really want to ensure their success in the program. And one very good tool to do that is to do a multidisciplinary team to see, to bring all of our resources to bear um, as to how we can ensure their success. That's, yeah, I, we've seen those work uh, pretty well. I think where we've seen things, you know, folks are different across different facilities. You have different ADA coordinators. And I think that the, the challenge that the if an MDT is called when it's like a program, I think we've seen those work out pretty well. I think the ones that we've had more trouble with is when there's an individual request and the communication. When it seems like it could be solved in such an easy like face-to-face -face communication, right. there might there might be sending a bunch of messages via kiosk, and maybe that's not the best way for this person to communicate. Um, and a, a lot of that I think comes down to is how much time this person is even able to dedicate to this portion of their job. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to say, talk about too, was um, when we wrote this report, Disability Rights Washington did about four years ago called Making Hard Time Harder, which really lays out like when people with disabilities go to prison, like their, their time there is just like harder than <laughs> all the things that they need to navigate. And it kind of goes through these, these different ways, um, hygiene, health, and safety, all the things you need to think about um, when you have a disability, how to communicate, communication access needs, and then access to programming. And so it goes through those. And one of the things that was kind of touched upon earlier is that folks with disabilities often end up staying in custody longer because it's harder to find placement for them. 
or that they can't get access to those less restrictive alternatives, like not alternatives, but less restrictive placements. They need mental health medications or things like that. There are very limited um, resources or placements for folks with disabilities to get in those lower custody settings to be more um, able to be integrated before uh, release. And that is a real, um, if we had unlimited people at our office, it would definitely be something that we would tackle. And also what happens upon release? Are you being violated more because you have disabilities and you need accommodations out in the community? Yes. And I Heather, think we're doing a better job of that, um, Heather, because we now have a, a re-entry administrator, uh, Angie Sauer. Um, and, and, and I agree that that's always something that needs to be continually worked on um, and to continually um, not just stop at the door, but make sure that the person has a warm handoff to wherever they need to go. I, it's something that certainly is uh, something that I am interested in, particularly when we look at people that with our intellectual disabilities, our TBIs, or some of those people were, were, were really working much more to move that way to their, so there's a warm handoff. Heather, is, right the, with it. is the making hard time harder um, study the report, is that available on your website? Yeah, I have the link here actually, and I can put it in the chat, but yeah, it's available on our website. It's actually Thank what you. we did was we took um, examples from protection advocacy agencies like ours around the country and like of all the work we've done in prison to try to get access. One of the things that that candy might mention in like terms of litigation, besides all the mental health litigation that goes on in prisons is the deaf and hard of hearing access litigation that was a real still is going on, but it was like, you know, last five years, tons of litigation around getting access to video relay service and um, interpreters and all that kind of stuff. And luckily with DOC um, and our state, that, that's a real priority and that they have that technology now. Thank you. Yep. yep, and when it comes to that litigation, I think that was a Duffy case that was back in the 90s um, with mm -hmm. Washington DOC. So I can tell you that even though that, that case technically resolved back in the 90s or late 2000s, um, the inmate population doesn't forget about the promises that were made in that settlement agreement, right? So even when I came on board in 2009, and at that time, the case had already been technically closed for six or seven years, um, you know, they remember and they hold you accountable. And so when we had an inmate in the TRU that was having issues with not being able to properly hear um, the over intercom system, um, you know, they brought that to our attention and DOC had to remedy that situation. But um, yeah, so it's never to when there's litigation that causes changes, right? Um, those things are ongoing. Um, and every so often, um, when you put that technically to bed, it's never really to bed because DOC has to continue um, to abide by the, those settlement agreements. But, you know, every so often it is a good thing um, to have an inmate remind you, hey, so I'm having issues with getting this. And um, these were things that were promised to me as part of that litigation. So, so yeah. and technology changes. I mean, yep. the technology they have now is not around then. Yeah. Yep. So Risa, can you, um, since we only have nine minutes left, I think it might be helpful for you to at least um, touch on maybe some of the biggest challenges you think as ADA coordinator um, with assisting inmates, and then um, some of the ways you think that um, our audience could help you all out. I know that um, David had talked about possibly putting something on a JMS, but what is the best way to contact you um, to provide assistance with someone that's gonna be coming into DOC custody? Mm -hmm. So um, I think the one of the biggest challenges we have is money. <laughs> Um, because, for, for example, um, right now we're doing, we, we received a grant um, from the, that we're doing for TBI at our facility in, at, uh, in Aberdeen. Um, we, but the grant's ending, and so I'm trying to scramble around to find a way to keep going, because right now it's been a really successful innovative um, program that's nothing else in the United States has. And basically what we're doing is we're taking folks that have uh, some functional deficits because of their history of TBI and we're doing 
uh, support groups, psychoeducation groups, and some other things. I want to, I really want to, I really have a heart to see that going and to expand it and to expand uh, doing um, more assessing for uh, people with TBI at our intake facilities um, because we know from um, the literature that's out there that um, the likelihood that somebody has had a history of TBI that's entering into a DOC facility is, is four times what it is in the general population. In the general population, uh, the incidence of TBI is about 8%. In uh, the prison setting, it's between 40, probably in 60%, and some places even higher, um, especially when you look at um, uh, IMUs, uh, high custody levels. So um, well, my passion right now is to be able to find money to, <laughs> to keep uh, this pr uh, program going because I think it's so important because really it does translate to community safety. If we can help people while they're incarcerated um, and uh, give a warm handoff when they leave for services, then um, hopefully we can prevent from committing more crimes. And that, you know, when I go back to our core values as an agency, um, it's safety of staff, safety of the public, safety of the individual. And if people are uh, managing their issues better in prison, um, they're going to behave better in prison. They're going to stay out of segregation, stay out of IMUs. They're going to go back to their families where they're going to go back anyway and lead a better life. And that's what we all want is for people to um, leave prison and not come back. So for me, money is one of the biggest challenges to make sure that we have programs that are ongoing that meet the needs that we have of our uh, population. Um, I think the other, pro the other issue that we have is just um, the amount of time that ADA coordinators um, can devote to what they do. But again, I am a full-time person and that's all I do is ADA so I can step in where I need to. So. Yeah, I think the TBI work has been important and um... It, it really was a lot of the work that or a lot of things I talked about that is how to have like universal design or universal precautions and how to just talk to everybody um and you know in respectful ways in assuming somebody has a TBI if someone's not responding quickly. I think a, a lot of the things I've learned from that project um can be applied throughout the facilities and help a lot of different people with different types of disabilities I'm not sure if it's out there in the gallery, but um, I just wanted to, we've got about six minutes to go before we have to wrap up. I wanted to just um, firstly ask if there's any questions that anybody in the gallery um, might have. Um, so I, I'm going to try to interpret a question from one of the uh, audience members. Um, I think the idea is when there's there's a need for services or some sort of accommodation that might not come through DOC, but through the families and how that how the families um, on the out the family of a of a person with disability on the outside can assist. Um, the printer to make sure that the accommod accommodation needs are met. I'm, I'm just sort of paraphrasing or interpreting, so forgive me if I got it wrong, questioner, but that's that's the question. Could you say that again? Um, well, I'm just, so I'm just reading something. Um, this is just from one, and this is a person that's asked several questions. One was about the, sometimes the delay in getting um, accommodation that might be requested, but this is another question that she's asked is, um, I think the idea is that when, when there's a prisoner with a disability and it, let's say you're thwarted at the DOC for whatever reason or frustrated, how can you have your family um, assist you in getting the accommodation that you, that you need um, and, and working with the DOC system, I, I suppose? Right. 
Well, well, normally, if somebody needs an accommodation, we are going to provide it in some limited uh, instances. Um, we have allowed the family to purchase something like a pair of special shoes because they had them on the outside, something like that. Um, but those are not very common. Um, we do get uh, reach outs from family members all the time. I get them weekly um, for in making an inquiry on their loved one uh, about something that they think they need. And sometimes, um, and we, we address it, um, and a lot of times uh, make a decision based on what's uh, best for the individual that's what the family was advocating for. So um, the family members are able to um, contact us with concerns. And, and, and who, would, who would be the, the specific point of contact to make sure that that information got conveyed to the right person? Well, if it's for an ADA accommodation, they can contact me or they can contact um, the healthcare provider um, or they can uh, contact the facility superintendent. Question here from Judge Rock, who asks, uh, um, what does the DOC do with pregnant women, um, which is not a disability, she says, but a health care need and um, what is permitted regarding housing the mother with the baby when it arrives? She acknowledges it's somewhat off topic, but um, right. I'm curious too, so. Well, we do get a lot of uh, uh, females that um, come into, into DOC um, pregnant, and we have policies around that. Um, we even have policies around um, the fact that we do not restrain uh, women who are in child active childbirth, we don't restrain them when we take them to the hospital. Um, we have uh, policies around, um, we do have a uh, program where women can keep their babies, I think up to a year. Um, there is criteria for that. Um, and I couldn't speak to all the criteria here, but, but there is a pathway for some women to keep their, their uh, babies in, in with them. So um, yes, we, we, we do have policies. We do, we do prenatal care, postnatal care. Um, so yes. Okay. Well, with that, I think we're right at the end. So I, I really just, my heart felt thanks to um, Heather, Candy, and, and Risa for all of your um, attention to this and your willingness to come and talk to us today. And I just want to say too that it's it's um, encouraging to me to have a, um, a sort of a spirit yet non-adversarial um, place to talk about these things because speaking for myself, I think we might not know what we're looking for sometimes. And um, I appreciate these types of talks because we can be more cognizant as we do our jobs. And the idea I think is to provide um, information to us and we can maybe help out without having to incur extra cost, but just so the process is streamlined and the communications can be better. So for that alone, I think I, I appreciate your input and I'll try to incorporate it with what I do. And I'll also try to, I'll read the making it, making hard time harder. I'm really chagrined that I haven't done that already. Um, and, and forward that around the court to the extent that there's information in there that a sentencing judge might, might find uh, useful. Um, all right. Well, again, thanks everybody. And also thanks for all of the participants out there who are, um, unnamed and I questions were great and um, hopefully we can do it again sometime soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right.